two liter bottle of water. Put a little bit of water in the bottom. Now try to balance it. And I couldn't because all the weight was really low. I couldn't maneuver it fast enough. Then he filled it all the way up. Now it was much heavier and it was much more unstable, but the center of gravity was higher. And so yeah, I was totally able to balance it. The rocket's the same way. They're unstable, but you want them to be unstable in a particular kind of way. You want to be unstable in a way to where you can control it. I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I went to Georgia Tech, got my master's degree there. Now I spent 10 years working at NASA. This is the kind of community I was thinking of. It had all of the same needs as a community on Earth would have, but it had some very unique constraints. He grew up talking space, living space. It is fourth grade state report on Alabama because of the rocket center and even from our first date, I knew he was passionate about space. Harrison Schmidt was the first trained geologist and only trained geologist to go to the moon. So he was a guy who knew what the heck to look for. And so the scientific take was so vast, it almost eclipses all the other missions put together. During the Apollo era, you didn't need government programs trying to convince people that doing science and engineering was good for the country. It was self-evident. And even those not formally trained in technical fields embraced what those fields meant to the collective national future. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they're easy, but because they are hard. Who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can design a plane that's a few percent more fuel efficient that doesn't really work. Saying, who wants to be an aerospace engineer because we need a plane that will navigate the rarefied atmosphere of Mars. You're gonna attract the very best of those students. And the solutions to that problem, in every case I've ever seen, have improved life back here on Earth. Zero and liftoff of the Atlas V with Curiosity. It had like heat shields and then a, a hypersonic drogue chute. I, I said this is not going to work. Retro rockets and then a hoist. It was some Rube Goldberg would have designed. An SUV sized rover was plunked down on Mars. How confident were you that this whole sequence of landing devices would have worked? I wasn't confident at all. I was shitting bricks. It was scary. This lander has more than 10 times as much scientific instrumentation than anything we've sent so to the surface So it needs more power. Needs more power, as Kirk would say to Scotty. Well, the last one was solar. This one's got nukes. Wait, wait, so you have a nuclear the... power plant on the rover? It's not a power plant. It's a power source. We're touchy about this, because when you use the nuclear word... One of the two verboten N-words. That's right, that's right. So, 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 so when we use that N-word, um, we, we, we try to speak carefully. And it's not like a nuclear power plant with the cooling towers and the turbines and all that. It's a bunch of plutonium that's given off heat, and we use that to generate electricity. So you found another thing to call it to not spook people when yeah. it's launched? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Apollo astronauts used plutonium RTG to power their science equipment. The Mars rover Curiosity is entirely powered by RTG. And it can run at night, it can run in any season, and it should be well, able to run. the ones had solar panels, they can only run in the daytime. Oh. Couldn't you charge a battery and keep working at night? In the Martian winter, the amount of power goes down. If your solar panels get covered with dust, So the Martian you winter, the sun to... is very low in the sky. Yeah. The Mars exploration rovers often found themselves short on power as dust settled on their solar panels. They were the only source of energy, and the Martian winter was approaching. The part of it that really breaks my heart is that we just didn't have power to drive anymore. Well, one of them did die because of the winter because it one got... One of the two rovers. Yeah, if, if the power goes down enough so that you can't run the heaters at night, then you die. That already happened with one of our previous rovers. So uh, if you want to do a lot of science, you want a lot of power, a lot of instrumentation, you want to last a long time and be able to rove anywhere on Mars. And nukes. Exploring space requires energy. Energy to run experiments. Energy to scrub carbon dioxide from astronauts' oxygen supply. The carbon dioxide removal assembly uh, is being worked on today inside the Destiny Laboratory. A uh, short was seen in one of the heating elements, but you see Mike Barrett there. He put a filter in there that helps uh, keep the water pure. The system uses water because obviously water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. 
it uses electrolysis, uh, which is passing an electrical current through that water to split the water into hydrogen and its oxygen. The hydrogen is dumped overboard. The oxygen is used to pump into the air uh, of the station for the crew members to breathe. You go to the moon and there's no oxygen atmosphere, there's no lakes of water or anything, so it really comes down to nuclear and solar power. Uh, they called it the N-word at NASA. They were saying, oh, we can't even talk about nuclear. It, and I said, how can we not talk about it? I mean, we have exactly two options for how to make power in space, and this is one of them, you know. Europa! Another Europa! A black and white picture of a ring of Jupiter! Okay. No! What? How do. You didn't get a second. Why is the Earth round? Why isn't it square or any other shape? That's a good question. I like that question. It's a question I have asked myself. And the answer has to do with gravity. Carl Sagan was a member of Voyager's imaging team. And it was his idea that Voyager take one last picture. That's here. That's home. That's us. Every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, on a mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. As we explore further from the sun, the utility of solar panels shrink to zero. To illustrate, imagine we can power a space mission orbiting the Earth with one solar panel. We'll call this solar panel the Earth panel. If we use Earth panel orbiting Venus instead of the Earth, we'll get almost twice as much electricity from it. Because orbiting closer to the Sun, more photons will be hitting the panel surface. The same Earth panel orbiting Mercury will generate almost seven times as much electricity. Mercury is closer to the sun. More photons hit the panel. But when we start moving away from the sun, in Mars orbit, we only get half as much electricity. So to power an identical space mission, we now need two Earth panels. At Jupiter, where only 4% as many photons can hit Earth panel, we now need 27 Earth panels to power the mission. The distance between Earth and Sun is what's called an astronomical unit. Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun. Jupiter is only five astronomical units away from the Sun, but requires 27 times as many solar panels. The relationship is not linear, it's quadratic. At Saturn, 91 Earth panels. Uranus, Neptune. At Pluto, 1,500 Earth panels are required to power the mission. Somewhere between Mars and Saturn, our mission became impractical. Clouds and haze completely hide the surface of Titan, Saturn's giant moon. 
Titan reminds me a little bit of home. Like Earth, it has an atmosphere that's mostly nitrogen, but it's four times denser. NASA's Cassini mission to Saturn pulled into orbit, dropped off of itself, a little probe? The probe Huygens descended down from the Cassini spacecraft and landed on Titan. Hidden beneath lies a weirdly familiar landscape. Titan has lots of water, but all of it is frozen hard as rock. In fact, the landscape and mountains are made mainly of water ice. On Titan, the seas and the rain are made not of water, but of methane and ethane. On Earth, those molecules form natural gas. On frigid Titan, they're liquid. There might be creatures that inhale hydrogen instead of oxygen and exhale methane instead of carbon dioxide. They might use acetylene instead of sugar as an energy source. How could we find out if such creatures rule a hidden empire beneath the oil dark waves? The probe Huygens landed in one spot. You know, it's a big moon. It's one of six moons bigger than Pluto, by the way. Uh, you know, what's the other side of the moon look like? The probe only had battery life for a couple of hours. We weren't there long enough to see how things change. Does it snow methane? So these long time baseline questions can't be answered by two hours worth of data. Cassini mission was launched in 1997, and Saturn is a long way away. It took seven years to get there. The Huygens probe launched from Cassini only operated two hours, but Cassini itself powered by plutonium RTG, continues to study Saturn and her 62 moons. For how long can plutonium power a mission? How far from the sun can we explore? The sun is constantly shooting out streams of charged particles in all directions. This solar wind blows a vast magnetic bubble. It pushes out against the thin gas of interstellar space, beyond the outer planets our heliosphere. There's a border where one ends and the other begins. It turns out there was a massive eruption from the sun which eventually reached Voyager 1 in April of 2013. It caused the plasma around Voyager to vibrate or oscillate by measuring that sound wave. We could measure the density of the plasma in interstellar space, the space between the stars. The Voyagers move about 40,000 miles an hour. They gave us our first close-up look at Jupiter's great red spot, a hurricane three times the size of Earth. We can now make out finer detail on Jupiter than the largest telescopes on Earth have ever obtained. The cloud patterns are distinctive and gorgeous. Its motion hypnotizes us. Four days after the uh, Voyager 1 encounter with Jupiter, I was looking at an optical navigation frame, became very evident to me was an anomalous crescent in the upper left-hand corner just off the limb of Io, a volcanic plume and in fact a volcanic eruption. The Voyagers discovered the first active volcano on another world, on Jupiter's moon Io. The Voyagers dared to fly across Saturn's rings and revealed that they were made of hundreds of thin bands of orbiting snowballs. Voyager successfully completed its mission of discovery to the outer planets, but its odyssey into the darkness was just beginning. 35 years after its launch, Voyager 1 became the first of our spacecraft to enter an uncharted realm. Until then, we didn't know where the interstellar ocean began. Oh, hello, universe. This morning, the New Horizons spacecraft made the closest ever pass near Pluto after being launched almost a decade ago, back when NASA had the cash to do cool stuff like this. And wow, the pictures are unbelievable. After almost a century of near total mystery, we finally know what Pluto really looks like. And we have to wait over a year now for all the information to come in. It's like opening up a birthday present every day from now until the end of the next year. Who doesn't love atmospheric data for their birthday? If you're watching, honey, hint, hint. And in 2019, 
New Horizons will start sucking up data once again as it passes by a Kuiper's Belt object at a distance from the Sun of 43 astronomical units. Compare the performance of Cassini, Voyagers, New Horizons, and the Curiosity Mars rover against solar and battery-powered exploration. The Mars rover Spirit froze to death thanks to dust on its solar panels. Huygens landed safely on the surface of Titan, but NASA only received two hours' worth of data. And most recently, the European Space Agency's 2014 achievement of landing a solar-powered probe named Philae on Comet 67P. Humanity landed a probe on a comet whose path spans both Earth's orbit and Jupiter's. Every six years, 67P nears the Sun, warms up, and ejects material from its core through vents on its surface. Every six years, 67P freezes once again as it drifts out towards Jupiter. Solar-powered fillet was never designed to survive a full orbit. But, inner orbit study, an appropriate challenge for solar panels, hit a snag. The landing produced some surprises. Philae didn't secure itself to the comet's surface and bounced, making multiple touchdowns. The final resting site was partly in shadow, receiving less sunlight to recharge its instruments. Philae was power-starved and unable to conduct experiments before freezing to death. Hours of operation? Decades of operation. Neil deGrasse Tyson is a tireless advocate for NASA, explaining to politicians and public what we miss when space exploration is severely financially constrained. We lost an entire generation of these smart people. They became like investment bankers or lawyers out of the 1980s and 90s because there's no place for them to take their interest in science. 